Um, again, this is Brittany Fernandez. I am the Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. I am really thrilled to welcome all of you to the latest installment of MDA's Advocacy Institute, um, something that we recently launched and we have found has been really informational for our community and, and we're pleased to bring you today um, a great speaker who's going to speak about the Americans with Disabilities Act and this month, the 30th anniversary of the passage of the ADA. Um, so we can go ahead and get right into it in our first slide and I will introduce our speaker. Um, so Allison Nickel is joining us from both the Epilepsy Foundation and uh, Georgetown University School of Law. Um, Allison has committed her career to serving uh, individuals individuals living with disabilities. Um, she was at the Department of Justice for more than 20 years as both the Deputy Chief and then Chief of the Disability Rights Section of the Civil Rights Division at DOJ, which enforces the ADA. Um, she was a Special Counsel on Disability Employment to the Deputy Associate Attorney General for Diversity and Inclusion. She was in the Office of, of the Associate Attorney General, in which capacity she served as a member of the Executive Staff of the Attorney General's Diversity Management Advisory Council. Um, Allison is coming to us today, both from um, Georgetown University School of Law, where she teaches disability discrimination, and in her position at the Epilepsy Foundation um, as the Foundation's Director of Legal Advocacy. And now I will turn it over to Allison to say a few opening remarks. Thank you so much, um, Brittany, and thank you for having me. And thanks to the to MBA for having you know, a celebration of my favorite law, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, it's hard to believe I've been doing this for 30 years, but I will tell you that uh, my uh, life path was set on this trajectory in 1993, uh, when four days after the employment provisions of the ADA took effect, and a man named Charles Wessel uh, walked into the EEOC offices in Chicago, where I was then, then working, and filed a charge of discrimination under the then very much brand new ADA. He had been terminated from uh, a very high paying long-term job uh, because he had brain cancer. And uh, three months later, uh, myself and uh, my co-counsel, Jim Camp, uh, uh, convinced the jury uh, that he had been discriminated against under the ADA and we rendered a verdict of $600,000. And so after that, um, I moved on to justice, as Brittany has already told you, and I don't want this webinar uh, certainly to be about me, but I think that um, I'm so glad we're doing this. You know, life brings many difficult moments, and I think we're all living through very difficult moments right now. And so I think it's good to take a step back and to celebrate the good things that have actually happened. Uh, and as I'm about to kind of unfold for you, uh, lots of people worked really hard to get this law passed, and then another group worked really hard to kind of make some changes to it that were necessary a few years later. But on balance, look, this has worked. This brought uh, so much positive change to the world for people with disabilities. And I think it's good for us to celebrate that even as we examine, as I will encourage you to do, you know, further, uh, further needs uh, down the road, but I think it's important to do the celebration part as well. Yeah, Allison, I, I totally agree, and, and thanks very much for being here today. We're really thrilled to have you. Um, I will say, it, just for everyone who's on the call participating, if you have questions for Allison or myself throughout the presentation, please enter them into the Q&A box. It's at the bottom of your screen, um, and we will get to those. Um, either you know during the presentation or afterwards but we will also have time for q a a live q a at the at the end of the presentation um so allison if you could give us um a brief overview of the ada um and how it came to be and and then you know the the provisions of it i think that um that would be helpful and, and we do have this slide here to help guide that conversation absolutely uh, let me go back just a little bit before the passage of the ada to 1973 which is the year i actually graduated from high school uh, when my friends were engaged in writing the regulations under uh, the then uh, new Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Uh, and there was a tug of war with the administration over whether or not those regulations would be published. And I think it's an important part of uh, ADA history to recognize that the longest siege of a federal building 
uh, by any group of people took place in California when they took over the offices of Joseph Califano and didn't leave until there was an agreement to publish those uh, regulations. So you know, what you're seeing all around you now in terms of protesting and fighting for the things that you need um, is, is what propelled this law forward. And so that Rehabilitation Act and the, Rehabil the Rehabilitation Act uh, applies to federal government, federal contractors, but that was the predicate, right? That was sort of the blueprint for bringing forward uh, those same principles and guidelines to apply to the public sector, okay? And so uh, we, they took that blueprint and they, and they made the ADA sort of from the architecture of the Rehab Act. Uh, it has five titles, uh, as you may already know. Employment in both the public and private sector, uh, state and local government programs, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but things like voting, things like wanting to, you know, to fish off a, a pier, wanting to take swimming lessons, you know, uh, at, the, at the, the summer camp run by your county, uh, and certainly voting, of course. Uh, and public accommodations, which is just what it sounds like. It's incredibly broad. It really, I explain it as, you know, anywhere that you would kind of, that you would go to spend money. So hotels, motels, restaurants, bars, uh, any kind of shopping, any kind of retail, uh, it, it's incredibly broad. Uh, and telecommunications have been a very uh, positive steps forward, I think, in, in, the, in telecommunication and, and, and more to come. But ensuring, for instance, that 911 centers will accept a call uh, from someone who is deaf and not hang up the call when they hear the beep, thinking, oh, this is a hang up call, uh, which is, is an, an, an uncom which is an all too common and unfortunately sometimes tragic uh, event. And so telecommunications, and there certainly are others. Uh, the big one that's not, uh, that, that is uh, not listed on this slide, but is uh, important, I think, to everyone, and that's transportation. So that sort of falls under uh, state and local government and public. It's in a separate title, but it's, it, it, so that's you know, municipal buses, it's Uber, it's Amtrak, it's, it's, it's everything except the interior of an airplane, which is covered by a similar law, but not the ADA. Uh, and so transportation, of course, is vital, um, as well as uh, education. So education, employment, really every facet of American life is somewhere in one of these five titles, even if you don't see the word um, the word listed there. Um, so that's, that's the general overview. It was signed in 1990. It's probably the last great piece of bipartisan civil rights legislation uh, that the country has seen. Um, and if you follow politics, I don't. I'm allergic to politics. It makes me sneeze. Uh, but if you do follow politics, you might think the world is so divided. How would we ever do this again? And uh, and I think it's good to know that it can be done because uh, it was done during the passage of the ADA. Uh, so I, is that a good stopping point? Should I just go forward? Do you want to ask questions? Yeah, I think, that, I think that's helpful, Allison. And we can move on to the next slide um, to continue here to, for some context around the Amendment Act as well. So one of the things that happened very, very early, and then actually, as counsel in the first case, I can tell you it actually happened in the very first case. Cracks started to emerge around the issue of what did disability mean? Um, and defense lawyers uh, made some very smart arguments that courts were very receptive to uh, that only a very small number of people should really be covered by this law. So not everybody's covered by the ADA, right? Only people who have disabilities, as that is defined within the law and the regulations. And so it's not like Title VII where everyone has a race or everyone has a gender, right? Um, this is this narrower group of people. So one of the things you have to prove under the ADA is that you belong, that you are al allowed to be in this group of people with disabilities to you know, cloak yourself in the coverage of the statute, right? Uh, and over to, and, and in the first case, I mean, the man had brain cancer. I thought it was evident that he was a person with disability. Uh, but the defense attorneys, even in that first case, tried to make inroads into uh, kind of chipping away at that definition. They were not successful in that case, but they were very 
very widely successful in many cases that followed. So much so, and, and one of the people whose cases actually spurred uh, the Amendments Act uh, for all of us to kind of get together and take action to fix the definition was a person who had muscular dystrophy. And he actually ended up um, testifying in front of Congress. And he had been offered a job uh, in Houston, uh, and he lived somewhere else, and he um, moved his family. It's a job that he had, had done for many years, he was highly qualified for. And when they found out that he had muscular dystrophy, which for him meant he couldn't lift his arms uh, completely over his head. And for some reason, his employer, despite the fact that he'd done the job uh, perfectly um, before they knew this, uh, decided that, that he couldn't, you know, and now he's, his family's in Houston, now he's got no job. So that was one. The other, I think, kind of seminal case that was sort of the straw that, that um, made the house of the definition come tumbling down was a case of a young man who had what was, used to be called mental retardation and now I think is called intellectual disability. Uh, and he applied to, for a job at Walmart and he had a job coach and his job uh, with a job co coach was going to be to gather uh, all the shopping carts in the parking lot. And he wasn't allowed to bring his job coach into his uh, interview. And so he didn't do well in the interviews. His coach wasn't with him and so he sued Walmart. Well, instead of getting to that question of whether or not that was discrimination, they decided that this young man who had mental retardation was not disabled enough to be covered under the ADA. So look, if we were at that point, then it's really hard to know who's left, right? Uh, and so that, uh, those many years kind of, there were some very bad uh, Supreme Court decisions that helped all of this along. Um, but cut to the chase, uh, in 2008, there was a bill passed called the ADA Amendments Act, which is an overlay onto the original statute, which restores some people will tell you it expanded the definition. As someone who makes their living doing this, it did not expand the definition. It did, however, restore the original intent of Congress uh, to cover a certain um, number of people uh, with these, you know, with these civil rights. And I now work with people with epilepsy. And I will just tell you, if it weren't for the Amendments Act, uh, people with epilepsy would no longer be covered under the ADA. That, that's very clear. And there certainly are many other groups, anyone with any kind of an episodic uh, relapse and remitting MS is another, um, and, and, and their, you know, the list goes on. So once we had the Amendments Act in place, it was much easier to, for the first time, honestly, ever, uh, get to the acts of discrimination. Because until 2008, which is not that long ago, at least in, in my life, um, we never got to what was discrimination under the statute because we're constantly fighting about who was covered. And so it's just now since 2008, 2010 and the last, you know, 10 years or so that we're finally fleshing out, well, what does it mean to be discriminated against under the ADA? What is a violation uh, of hair transit? What is a violation of uh, public accommodations who are excluding people with service animals? Uh, and so that world is just finally kind of coming together and in the world of the law, uh, 10 years is short, is a very short period of time, right? Uh, and so uh, that's kind of the, that's the architecture, that's the framework that we're all uh, that we're all working with now, uh, moving forward. Thank you. I, I think that's really eye-opening and um, and and a lot of really great information for us to be able to to share, you know, kind of across the community about you know all these changes that even though the ADA was passed 30 years ago. It was only 10 years ago that we were able to ensure that, you know, everyone living with a disability can really be covered um, by the protections of the law. Um, so I, I think it goes to show that, you know, advocacy, continued advocacy on the part of, you know, our communities around our priorities is, is absolutely integral to ensuring that laws that were passed and, you know, with the intention to benefit these communities need to continue to, to do so. And actually the pressure needs to be put on lawmakers and, and you know, the regulatory bodies um, to do what, what they need to be doing in order to protect the communities that we serve. Um, so thank, thanks for that overview there. Uh, Mark, we can go to the next slide and talk a little bit about what's happening right now with the ADA. So we have a couple of questions up here for Allison to answer. Um, I think that, you know, this is especially, 
considering the fact that we're doing this as a webinar and not as an in-person meeting, um, the fact that you know COVID-19 really prompted us to move more towards you know, the virtual um, platform for for our advocacy work. You know, talking about how does how how does COVID-19 impact the ADA and its enforcement and you know its uh, the rights that people still have even throughout a pandemic, I think is something that needs to be addressed right now. Because oftentimes we hear, oh, you know, we're in a pandemic, all the rules are off the table when it comes to certain, you know, when it comes to laws or regulations. And so knowing, you know, that our rights are, these rights are still there, they are still, you know, enforceable is, is critical. And so we wanted to make sure we had this um, portion of the conversation uh, reserved for, you know, for everybody who's on. And so I will say, especially right now throughout the call, obviously enter questions whenever you'd like, but if you do have specific questions about, you know, enforcement or, or anything around the ADA as it relates to, um, you know, the public health emergency and, and the COVID-19 pandemic, please do enter those into the Q&A now. Um, I'll go ahead and get us started with these uh, uh, with these few questions for Allison, and then, and then we'll move on along to anything else that comes in. Um, so the first one is, you know, how has the current pandemic affected enforcement of the law? Sure. First, I'd just like to echo this, your, your earlier sentiments that uh, passing the law is one thing, and that was a lot of blood, sweat, and literal tears that went into both that and the Amendments Act. But there is no day in which you do not have to fight for your civil rights. There is almost no day. There is no day for me in which I am not fighting to maintain what we have. So getting it is one thing. Maintaining it is just as large a struggle. And there is no end date. There is no end date for the enforcement side. Um, so if you feel fatigued and frustrated that you're still having to fight for things. I empathize with that and I understand that because I see people undergoing that, you know, every single day. Um, so there are some emerging legal issues around the pandemic itself. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the, that. Uh, look, the pandemic, it seems like it's been around for me for a long time. But in the, in the life of a pandemic, as someone who did 30 years, 40 years of AIDS work, in the life of a pandem pandemic, it's really pretty young. And so there are a lot of things that we don't know. We have to understand that, you know, I read the CDC website every couple of days. Uh, this stuff is emerging more and more every day about the science of transmission uh, and also about the civil rights end of it, okay? And so uh, I think you're all aware we're having a, uh, we, have, we have an unfortunate uh, habit in this country of conflating and mixing politics with health, and that's unhelpful in every circumstance, including this one. Uh, so I don't, again, I'm allergic to politics, don't wanna talk about that, but I think it's unhelpful to have a conflation of those two things. Um, so when you talk about the emerging, le emerging legal issues, uh, there are questions like, if let's say you're a person who needs to use a public bus and you're a wheelchair user, and you're used to the kneeling bus to boarding in front. Well, a lot of those buses aren't boarding in front anymore because they're trying to protect the driver. So they're making people board either from the rear or from the center door. It doesn't have a lift. So these things have to be kind of worked out one by one by one. Uh, and it has caused some conflict. It's also uh, caused some conflict with riders, uh, which is you know, not uncommon. Uh, so, so that's kind of one example. The other, I think, then the, and the biggest one is masks. Uh, we have people in our population, uh, people I represent, for whom wearing a mask is actually dangerous, uh, especially if they're not in a position where they're going to be able to get it off quickly if they should have a seizure. Uh, there are lots of other people in that category. Um, you may be, you may have, you may know people, or you, your maybe your kids, or but maybe you. Uh, the CDC has some helpful language around mass mandates, mask mandates, and people uh, with disabilities. It's not very much, and I don't know how successful um, we're going to be uh, in uh, getting people the proper civil rights treatment, the, the proper sort of modification of policy of wearing masks for people with disabilities, and this has been sort of further complicated by a bunch of fraudulent, um, you know, made up, you know, sort of cards that somebody's selling saying I have a disability and I, and that, that happens all the time. There's always fraud with respect to disability. Um, so I think you need to think about that. I mean, I think um, even just traveling and going outside your house, um, 
if you have a child for whom that's difficult and your child's going to be returning to school, are they going to be able to tolerate wearing a mask? And if not, you know, are they going to be able to have an online product that's going to be equivalent for them? And then the big one, which is return to work, right? I mean, someone may be able to tolerate a mask for a half an hour, uh, but to go back into a work environment, um, depending on what you do for a living, it could be uh, very close quarters. It could, you know, we all think in terms of, you know, whatever the job is we do, right? So I'm a white collar person, um, but I've also worked in steel mill. I know people who work at the Jiffy Lube. There are lots of different employment environments and are people really going to be able to tolerate a wearing a mask for seven, eight, nine hours a day? Uh, people with asthma, that could be very problematic. People with cystic fibrosis, that could be very problematic. People on the spectrum, that could be very problematic. And so uh, the EEOC has not been overly helpful at this point. Uh, I'm giving advice about what will happen if you're the person who can't, uh, can't wear a mask and return to work. Because we know one of the more nefarious aspects of COVID is that it can be spread by a non-symptomatic person. So yeah, they can take your temperature at work and they can do simple things, but uh, if you're asymptomatic, uh, you can still spread the virus. And that's where the mask mandate comes in when you're talking about going back, uh, going back to work. And so let's say you are a person who gets a reasonable, com I, think it, I think you can get a reasonable accommodation related to that even for employment. And there are some things, depending on, again, on the work environment. Um, where maybe you can be more isolated at work, but I think there's gonna be conflict. If you're the person who walks into work and you are the person who can't uh, tolerate uh, wearing a mask, that's gonna be problematic. And the kinds of uh, reasonable accommodations the EOC is offering, like work from home, don't work for people who work at the Jiffy Lube and lots of other places. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I feel like uh, you have something you want to say. But... No, I was just gonna say, Allison, I, I think that's right. And it's something that we're definitely um, as an organization, you know, really cognizant of, especially considering the fact that many people living with neuromuscular diseases are, are at a greater risk for COVID-19. And so kind of that, um, the, you know, the question of whether to, to wear a mask, if it could, you know, negatively impact you versus, you know, the, bet, the good impact of wearing it to, you know, to prevent yourself from getting sick is definitely something that everyone and their, you know, doctor needs to make a decision about. I'll say MDA, though, you know, on, on the advocacy side of things, we're fighting for things like reasonable accommodations, better F FMLA leave for parents, you know, to help them for parents of children with conditions so that they can stay home and not risk getting sick and, and, and you know, kind of having these options so that, you know, parents don't feel like they have to go back to work, make the choice between the health of their child or their or their you know way or their their income is is something that um is a problem and it's, it's definitely kind of rolled up in the whole mask issue for individuals with you know complicated health care issues um so it's definitely something that that mda is working on on, on you know a larger spectrum and, and appreciate your thoughts on that um i would you know like for you to expand upon, um, you know, rights of individuals right now, though, when it comes to keeping themselves, you know, safe and protected during the pandemic. Is there anything other than what's happening in the EOC, say, for example, you know, somebody who uses a wheelchair and needs to go to a testing center that may have been set up, you know, in a, in, you know, a public area and it's not ADA compliant? I mean, what do they do? in that situation and, and what are their rights when it comes to ensuring that they can te get tested in a safe place and, and not have to, you know, either not get tested because they're worried about not being able to access it or, you know, feel like they can't utilize um, the public health system that's, that's supposed to be set up for, for everyone. Sure, and that's a great question. We have had those complaints. Uh, and actually we had a complaint from the great state of Iowa uh, where the governor set up uh, drive-in only uh, test sites, not understanding that not everyone drives, including people in my population and, and lots of other people. And when asked uh, by us and others, uh, if you could would set up a walk-in site or just let people walk up to the drive-in sites and be tested, she said, well, and I quote, people with disabilities are just on their own. Uh, no, actually, no, they're not. Um, 
And so you do, you do see this. I do have concerns about vitriol being directed toward anyone who's not wearing a mask for dis disability related reason. Uh, reason doesn't seem to be always a part of the calculation of the way people behave. I want to, I'll talk about one, um, one other situation. So if you are a person who feels as though you may uh, have COVID or you are very ill and you want to go to an emergency room and you have a caregiver, uh, there has been uh, in some states um, uh, that has been prohibited because they don't want any extra people in the emergency room. They don't want any extra people in the ICU. And so people uh, in the disability rights community, um, DREDF and, and disability rights organizations throughout the country have been uh, getting those policies changed so that if you need a caregiver, that caregiver can go with you into the hospital. The other thing that has been, we have been fighting about is the rationing of medical equipment uh, like ventilators. And so some states have come out with policies essentially saying people on this list, and you know it's all people with disabilities on that list, uh, you go to the bottom. And if there's a fight over a ventilator, you're not gonna get it. Uh, and so we had to go in and we had to do that as well. So the way that you can protect yourself, let's say you go into the 7-Eleven and the person says, you can't come in here without a mask. You know, you can ask for a reasonable modification and explain that you're a person with a disability and you, you have the right to go in there without a mask. And if that's not successful, the other reasonable modification is then, okay, you come to me. Here are the five things I want to purchase. Here's my credit card. If you're not going to let me in and, and abide by your obligation to reasonably modify this policy for a person with a disability, you can't just not serve me. You know, the, the non-service part is not, uh, that's not okay under the ADA. That can't be, that cannot be the alternative. Uh, so, so in that situation, I think that reasonable modification goes a long way. Um, I think employment is, is much more difficult because it's not a, a touch and go situation. People are together for uh, much longer pieces of time, but, uh, but you do have the right to ask for reasonable modification. If you are covered by the FMLA, uh, you can ask for FMLA leave to take care of yourself as well as if you have a family member who has, has COVID or is just ill altogether. Um, so you, if you, as long as you have one of those FMLA reasons, yes, you should be able to do that. A couple of the funding bills also carried with it, uh, carried with them additional FMLA leave uh, for COVID-related reasons. If you, for instance, are suffering from COVID or, and, you, and you're not an FMLA-covered employer, uh, you may be eligible to get leave under that that statute now it's, it's very finite this the, that kind of goes away at some point I don't know if we're at the point where it goes away yet but they have created some mechanism new mechanisms for leave that you might be able to um, to avail yourself of um, and then the question I mean if you're not a person who can work from home there aren't a lot of options for reasonable accommodations unless you're working uh, look if you're if you're the groundskeeper at RFK Stadium or at a school, and you don't have contact with other people, um, I think you could ask for a reasonable accommodation of not having to wear a mask, because you don't, you don't pose a risk to anyone, right? Because you're not coming to contact with people. Um, so the, the, you know, it's very situational, and so you have to be very specific about what is the job, what is the danger, are there other people around? Um, I'll say one more thing about rights and COVID. Do not, get lulled or sucked into by your school district signing away your children's rights to, to, to receive, if they're on a, if they have an IDEA plan uh, or they're a kid with a disability and they're getting services in school, do not, the school districts all over are trying to get parents to sign off on less product for their kid, less services. Uh, schools have a continuing obligation to meet their their disability obligations to children under IDEA, uh, as well as under the Rehabilitation Act, and don't settle for less. Don't be bullied into settling for less for your kids. If they're gonna go online with their product, their product has to include everyone. That's just a little side rant on my part. Yeah, Allison, and thank you for bringing that up. I actually was just talking with, you know, one of my colleagues the other day who is a parent of, you know, a child living with um, a neuromuscular condition, and she was, um, you know, sharing with me the decision that she is trying to make about, you know, uh, 
how to get her child back into school when it comes to the new semester this year and, and the accommodations that the school either is or isn't going to be making um, in a virtual format that they do, you know, make in, um, in, an, in an in-person setting. And, and it's definitely a challenge that we're seeing um, right now and that, that a lot of parents are struggling with. Are there any resources on that specifically that you would suggest um, that parents take a look at for, you know, as they decide whether or not to send their children back to school? I don't. I mean, the only, um, uh, I spent many years relying on the CDC when I was in the federal government, uh, but I understand there's some skepticism around this issue with the CDC. I haven't seen the most recent guidance. We did a comparison of the first two that were put out on schools, and now there's a third. Um, I, these are very individualized questions. Um, I think uh, if you cannot you know, be, if you can't be an advocate for your kid, find someone who can. I don't, I don't know what those um, online products are going to look like. I know that the people that I know who have kids who, who have IEPs have been very dissatisfied with the, you know, with the uh, online um, services that their kids are being given. I feel like their kids are are really falling behind. I think if you're in a school district who says, everybody's got to come to school, uh, no. If you have a child who's at high risk for COVID, you, your child is not, in my view, have to go to school. Uh, they've proven, I can't say it's a fundamental alteration anymore because most school districts have already done online learning for you know half a year. So it's not a fundamental alteration question anymore. They have then an obligation, I think, as a modification if your child needs online learning because you don't trust that the school environment is going to be, make them safe from COVID and their kid with a disability, I think they have the right to ask for online learning. Um, and, uh, you know, it just depends on your relationship with your school district and how you know, Right, how right. And, you know, every, every school district is different. And, you know, yeah. you've seen one, you, you've seen one. It's kind of, you know, like yeah, exactly. <laughs> that old thing about CMS right. programs. Um, so I think that, you know, you're right. I, I would say what, what you say about advocating for your child is, is totally on point. You know, do everything that you think is best for your child is what's best for your child when it comes to, um, you know, the risk of, of COVID-19 and going back to school. Um, I think that we can move on to the next slide now um, and talk about, I know we have a lot of questions coming in and we are going to get to all of the questions that are, that are in the Q&A, so keep them coming and, and we'll just go ahead and take all the questions at the end. Um, so room for improvement in the ADA. There's a lot of room for improvement and updates and, you know, as you guys, as we discussed earlier already, the Amendments Act that passed in 2008 did, you know, did a lot. Um, obviously, you know, I think something that we hear often from our own community is enforcement of provisions. And we have a couple of questions in the Q&A box that kind of get at this. Um, education of people who are subject to the ADA and, and have to enforce it, like employers and educators and you know, business owners and um, people that interface with the public is, is something that is always of importance. Air travel, you know, the, the um, Air Carrier Access Act passed before the ADA did, but there's still so much that's left out of that bill and that's some, or, or out of that law. And that's something that um, MDA advocates on, you know, improvements to that, to that law um, that we advocate on, you know, on behalf of our community uh, tirelessly. I mean, we get, we, we get questions from people in the Northwest Bear community about air travel on a regular basis. And, and so that's one of our big priorities. And then, you know, technology and social media platforms, like how are they accessible to people living with disabilities? Um, and, and what do we need to do to make them to make them better and more accessible as we see new tech coming out every day, you know, is it all ADA compliant? And even if it is, does that mean it's accessible just because it's ADA compliant? Um, it might not be considering the fact that tech is evolving, you know, at, at light speed. So Elton, if you have any comments on, you know, any of these areas of improvement or, or others that you would like for our advocates to be thinking about, um, I'd love for you to share those now. And, um, and if there are questions about, you, you know, I would just say if, if questions keep coming in, we can we'll address those as well. Thank you. Sure, um, absolutely. I think the three major deficiencies that remain in the three major gaps, uh, and despite, uh, you know, well, now 30 years of enforcement, uh, the disability rights section at the Justice Department still gets between 15,000 and 17,000 complaints every year 
under the public accommodation state and local government provisions of the ADA. I don't know how many uh, employment complaints that the uh, uh, EOC gets, but I'm, I'm sure it's just a fraction of the actual discrimination that goes on because those complaints only reflect the people who, you know, had enough knowledge about where to file a complaint and had the time to do it and, um, and the expectation that doing it was gonna do some good. So that's probably, um, those numbers while startling to me uh, are still only represent a, a fraction of the kind of discrimination that we're still seeing, even in the most basic things. Uh, but the three gap areas I think that are larger still remains to be education. Uh, we're still falling down and failing kids with disabilities in education. Uh, certainly in, in K through 12, I think um, this administration in particular uh, uh, has been uh, somewhat behind uh, where they should be in, in serving the needs of kids with disabilities. Um, there are some uh, problems with, uh, with college, but not nearly as many. It's mostly a K through 12 uh, issue. So I think, I think education's always been lacking forever, really, even you know, since the beginning of the Rehab Act uh, through, through every, every phase of this. Uh, second, I would probably um, put uh, tr uh, transportation. I think the paratransit, paratransit systems are not any better now than when I started working as an ADA lawyer. Uh, they get marginally better, and then they get worse. They get marginally better, and then they get worse. You know, uh, you see finally some successful lawsuits in New York around inaccessible subways. Um, some of the bus transportation providers are pretty good. Some are not. Uh, we're kind of past the point now where any municipal bus should not be fully accessible uh, to someone who's a wheelchair user or, or a person who's uh, deaf or hard of hearing or blind. And so, um, you know, the Time has expired on that. We need, we need to do better. I think the, um, one of the exciting things that technology is bringing in is, is the driverless car. Uh, driverless cars are really important to the, the folks that I represent who often cannot drive. Um, and maybe for other who, uh, maybe an eventual replacement for paratransit uh, as time moves forward, at least if that's what we're hopeful. We're a long way from there, but um, that is a hopeful invention uh, that's out there. And in the meantime, I think they're trying to use, uh, uh, transportation is trying to use Uber and other ride sharing to close the gap on paratransit. I hope that works. Uh, they're trying to incentivize drivers to, to get accessible vehicles. Uh, and you know, obviously these people also have to be trained. But I think transportation is still a very large gap. But the biggest gap of all, I think, is employment. Um, I think that people with disabilities still lag way behind others. Uh, in employment. I know that the folks that I talk to literally without exception every day I get calls from at least a half a dozen people telling me I had a seizure at work I lost my job. I had a seizure at work. I lost my job. There's no discussion about a reasonable accommodation uh, And some of these people frankly don't need a reasonable accommodation You know, they have a seizure they go home and they come back to work the next day So it isn't always a reasonable accommodation issue. The only reasonable accommodation they need is for their employer not to uh, have a complete lack of understanding of uh, epilepsy and seizure disorder and not totally freak out and just say, you can't work here. Uh, but I see that as a huge gap and, and I, I have yet to find the key to unlock that door. Um, we're unfortunately in a situation where uh, lots of people are not being called back to work. And because we have this funny system in America where whether or not you're employed means whether or not you have health care. You know, it's always a dual hit for people who lose their employment, uh, especially if you're a person with a disability or if you have a family member with a disability who relies on your insurance. Uh, for some people, the income, replay, the, the lost income is less important than the lost insurance because there aren't a lot of uh, reasonable alternatives, especially if you have a, a pre-existing condition. And we know that the Affordable Care Act is always in this kind of precarious position of, you know, will it survive or not? Uh, so I think employment is a big one. Most of the jobs now are being created by small employers who have less than 15 employees, so they're not even covered by the, um, by the ADA. And so I think we're all struggling. Uh, we're all struggling uh, with how to close that gap. And I, and I don't think any of us have found uh, any, any really great uh, overarching answers for that. Yeah, I would agree. And, and we definitely... Um, hear a bit of that, you know, from the community that, that that's a struggle for people living with neuromuscular conditions. Um, 
that you know em employment is a problem. I think we can go to the next slide now. Um, talk a little bit more about that. Um, so that segues us nicely into this. You know, what what is MBA doing on issues of um, civil rights for people living with with disabilities in an muscular community? And one of those is air travel. Um, as we discussed earlier, we are you know endorsers of the Air Carrier Access Amendments Act, which would expand that law um, to ensure that individuals have individuals um, living with disabilities have better access to air, you know, air travel. And this is something that we're focused on, not just because everybody should be able to travel by air for any reason, um, but because oftentimes, you know, in the rare disease community, which you know everyone under the MTA umbrella is part of, um, participating in a clinical trial or seeing a specialist is something that requires travel and, and you can't necessarily always do it in a car. And if you have to fly across the country to be able to see a specialist or just not go, I mean, it's, it's better to, to be able to take it, to, to take the plane there. And so, you know, access to healthcare means, or access to, you know, access to air travel for many people means access to innovative clinical trials or, um, or, or subspecialists that you need to see. And, and so we're really committed to that in addition to just ensuring that people living with neuromuscular conditions can travel for work or on vacation or see families just like everybody else can. And, and so that's something we're continuing to push for that more accommodations can be made by both DOT and the airlines um, for, for people living with disabilities. On the topic of employment opportunities, um, there is a bill in the Senate led by Senator Bob Casey that would incentivize employment of people living with disabilities. It is, it, 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 we are in, endorsers of it. It's, it's um, a rather narrowly focused bill, but it is a start that would um, allow for employers to apply for grants to, um, to retrofit you know, their facilities in order to accommodate people living with disabilities or, or better be able to um, bring on you know, a new staff or a new member of the team um, I believe it also includes tax benefits for people who hire people living with for employers who hire people living with disabilities, which is also a positive there. It's a step in the right direction. It's not an answer to to any of these issues, but um, definitely something that we're supportive of. And and Senator Casey has long been a champion of of the disability community in the Senate. I will say that um, those who live in Pennsylvania and his state are very lucky to be represented by him. Um, and then we also want to see improvements and expansion to the ABLE Act, which allows you know people um, to save more money without you know the, the negative negative tax um, implications for them, people living with disabilities. And, and that ABLE Act was was really important um, when it was originally passed, and, and we're we're glad to be able to support measures that would improve it and, and continue to 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 work towards you know more financial independence for for people in our community. Um, so now I know we have a lot of questions in the chat box and we only have 15 minutes left, so let's go ahead and get right to them. Um, so the first one came in about access to TTY phones, um, also known as TTB phones, and if it's required, where they're required. Allison, do you have any um, you know, insights on that? You know, What government bodies or, or businesses are required to have that TTY um, phone service other than emergency lines oh i think a lot i think uh i'd have to go back and look at the reg the specific language on that and technology uh has evolved a little bit as more and more people have shifted on to to iphones but certainly um for example uh if there is a hotel that you're staying at and uh you need to call the front desk and you need to use that kind of a device the hotel's going to have to have that for you. So there are, frankly, in public accommodations uh, where calling would be a feature of their service. That is, uh, as I understand it, that is still uh, absolutely required that it, be, uh, that it be provided to you. Now, I can't tell you exactly which public accommodations kind of are in the business where that would be a regular course of what they do, but certainly a bank, for instance, uh, who's getting, who has a hotline, who's getting calls, uh, as people are, especially people are moving to electronic banking, um, certainly. Um, so kind of any, think of it just as any public accommodation uh, where uh, they're encouraging as a part of their service, that that's something that calling or having contact with the staff is something they offer. It'd be my best, 
my best answer to that. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions also about, um, let me just make sure I, I get both of them in because I think we had two about the same issue. Um, ADA parking, so the abuse of handicapped parking spaces, um, where um, basically around what, how can people be sure that enforcement of provisions to protect ADA parking um, is something that is actually done in their communities? And I think I, think I can answer this one, and Allison, I'll let you chime in as well. Um, when it comes to, you know, ADA parking, that is something that's guaranteed, I believe, you know, through, through the ADA or, or accessible parking, but, you know, really being involved with your local municipality when it comes to this is critically important. And, you know, when, if, if you are experiencing, um, uh, you know, issues with accessibility to parking because people are abusing it or, you know, parking in those spaces without, you know, the necessary placards or, or, um, um, or registration, you know, that's, and, it, and it's something that happens on a regular basis, whether that's, you know, at a business or, you know, downtown at, you know, the courthouse or wherever it is, I would say involving your, your municipality in that is, is important because they do have the enforcement ability there to do that. But if they don't hear from people who are affected by it, they're not going to, they're not going to, they're not going to act on it as often. And so I would say, you know, you need to speak up for your rights. And oftentimes that's, Frustrating, right? Because it's supposed to be there for us anyway. We shouldn't have to ask for it. Um, but I, I would say being involved with making that request of um, your local municipality to get more, to crack down more on that kind of abuse of the system is, is important. Allison, is there anything else you'd like to mention on that? Um, I'll just say one, uh, uh, one short thing. Uh, if the situation is like a big box store where in the summer they put all the flowers and, and all of that, stuff in the and block the accessible parking or use accessible parking spaces or do so in the winter with all the winter supplies that's how that's seen under the law as a failure to maintain accessible features and so that actually can be the subject of a, a federal complaint under title three to the disability rights section the other thing i think in turn and i think that that's great advice that they gave great advice on this the other thing i'm seeing that is really of concern to me is we're seeing spaces reserved for all kinds of things like women with children, I thrown my post of women with children, uh, being close to the entrance. Uh, I saw one, a couple in Florida, reserved for people who are going to Starbucks. Um, uh, can't be instead of accessible parking, right? I mean, you can have them in this ward and maybe add some things, but you can't diminish the level of accessible parking that the federal law requires. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question related to COVID-19. Um, for people living with neuromuscular conditions who may be suspected of having, you know, in the early phases of, of contracting COVID-19, are there other specific medical treatments that have been shown to help them as opposed to healthier individuals? So I'll answer this one because this isn't a really specific to um, Allison's area of expertise. I will say that we haven't seen anything specific for the neuromuscular community on this. Obviously, many people in the neuromuscular community, including those with issues um, related with respiratory issues, you know, have that need to access possibly ventilator care when they get, if they contract COVID-19. And, and that's something that we are on top of ensuring that there is no discrimination against um, for that kind of access. Um, so I think that, you know, one other aspect of this question is, do people with disabilities like this affecting the lungs receive faster treatment? So it really comes down to the triage policy of the hospital. You know, what is the, um, what is the emergent care for that individual? How do their, how does their need out, you know, kind of put them ahead of others? Um, and we have fought to ensure that people living with neuromuscular conditions, and we've done a lot of this with the Epilepsy Foundation with, with Allison, um, to ensure that people in our community are not pushed down the list because of their need to access care like ventilators. Because there are triage policies in certain states and hospital systems that are not ADA compliant 
that would indicate that individuals living with certain conditions under, you know, certain disabilities or conditions would not be prioritized to receive care. And that is a violation of the ADA. It's a violation of people's civil rights. And so, you know, we, we were glad to see that the Office of Civil Rights at, the HHS, at HHS issued some guidance on this a few months ago. We think that it needs to go further. We think that enforcement needs to be um, actually ramped up on this to ensure that this isn't actually happening. Um, but yes, the thought here that access to ventilators um, or, or other services for individuals um, who might be subjected to those old triage policies um, is definitely top of mind for us right now at MBA. Allison, is there anything else you wanna say on, on triage policies? I know that you've really been leading the way here. No, I mean, I think, uh, I think you, you put it beautifully. We, uh, we have to eliminate from, um, these, look, these policies, these are moral documents. They tell us what we care about and what we value. And so you can't have a document or policy that says we value this group of people less. We think this group of people's lives are not as worthy as this group. No, that's not the calculation. It's a medical calculation based purely on who's the most likely to survive the virus and nothing else. There can be no other considerations other than that uh, without, you know, unless you're running afoul of the ADA. And it's, um, honestly, I'm shocked and appalled that we're so 30 years into the ADA and this is something that isn't, uh, isn't known and uh, isn't being adhered to. It's, it's just shocking to me. Yeah, um, agreed. And, and Thank you for all your work there. I will say to you know all everybody on the call that um, Allison has been you know really critical and integral to, to everything that's happened on, on this issue of triage lately, and we're we're grateful for her leadership here. Um, here's another question about air travel. Um, access to commercial aircraft currently covered by the Air Carrier Access Act. Um, People with disabilities requiring a rich wheelchair is difficult, difficult, and even more so during the pandemic. Do you ever see a time, Allison, when the ADA will incorporate air travel and the protection of passengers against discrimination because of their disability? Um, ADA has been key to accessible bus and train travel. So do you ever see a possibility that ADA could be extended to air travel? Um, do you think that this is more requirement of our work on bills like the Air Carrier Access Amendments Act, um, or do you think it could be kind of enveloped in, into the larger ADA? I mean, I think it could. It would, would certainly require an act of Congress to do that. Um, I'd like to say I think if it was part of the ADA, it'd be a lot, everything would get a lot better. I'm not sure that's true. I think some of the uh, very difficult problems about rail travel for people who are wheelchair users uh, aren't necessarily going to be uh, made whole uh, by, by by having it come under the ADA. I mean, I think, I think the most important things that are happening now are two things uh, that are they're actually within our grasp. Uh, and one is the TSA, before you board, is working on uh, the mechanics of things that where your search will be far less intrusive uh, as a, a wheelchair user and you will have a better TSA experience. And I, they are generally working hard on that. We meet with them on a regular basis. So that's pre-boarding. I mean, I think that the, the issues around uh, having to transfer inability uh, to use a bathroom on the plane, uh, people are, are trying uh, very hard uh, to get passed into law um, as part of the, uh, the amendments uh, that you would be able to stay in your wheelchair uh, while you are flying. I think that's what m many, if not most people who are wheelchair users would greatly prefer. Um, I think the toileting issue is still probably many years away because, you know, airplanes fly for a long time and, you know, designing that. Uh, but they are working on that for the first time and that, that is underway. But in terms of things that may be within our grasp, I think TSA definitely a better boarding experience and the likelihood that there may come a day when you can not have to transfer, that you can, you can travel uh, in your wheelchair. And I, and I, you know, look, I hope that happens. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, that's part of the ACAA um, proposal too that that we have been pushing, and so um, we're we're glad to you know continue to work on that. Um, we do have another question about school. Um, so this is this question came in from one of uh, from a parent. She says, "At the school my kids attend now, they're allowed to do virtual based school or to go back in person. However, if they do the virtual way, they can't play sports." 
but you just brought up a good point, which is what about the kids with disabilities that do at home school to stay safe, but then they also want to do sports or other extracurricular activities? Um, is that fair? You know, if they decide to stay home because of their, you know, a, a condition um, that they have already and that they would be, you know, an outsized risk of, of contracting COVID-19 and, and then the risk of that, you know, but then that would preclude them from other activities with their, um, with their fellow students. Is that fair? Well, there's two different questions. Is it fair or is it illegal? Right. Yeah. Um, and so I, unfortunately I'm not in the fairness business. Uh, I'm only in the law business. Uh, doesn't seem fair. Absolutely. Um, so I think part of the answer is we don't know yet. We don't know. The Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education has not spoken to these more uh, complicated uh, questions. And I, um, I don't have a sense that, that any of that real information is going to be forthcoming. I think you certainly have a legal argument that that's because your child cannot tolerate uh, a mask or is just at greater risk for, for catching the virus and can't uh, tolerate a mask for an entire school day does not mean that they cannot um, go to chess club, does not mean that they cannot participate. Uh, you know, I, sports, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how many high schools or is a high school sports are even going to be going forward. Um, so I, I think some things it's easier to make that argument. Uh, if you're playing a team sport and you're in close contact with people, hmm, or if you're on the swim team, I think it's a harder argument to say then you cannot uh, also tolerate a, a mask in school. It's a, these are very difficult questions that require highly specific facts, and it would be helpful if the Office of Civil Rights would speak to some of these complicated questions, because there are many parents uh, who have these questions, and I don't have a lot of answers for them. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that perspective there. I agree with you. It's, it's unfair. And until we see more, you know, from um, Department of Ed, it'll, it'll kind of remain to be seen, you know, what, what the feds are going to be enforcing. Um, here's another question. If seeking a lawyer to help with ADA compliance with IEPs, what would you look for in a lawyer? Is there an ADA credential that lawyers receive? Is it just through the lawyer's focus area? Or do you have other advice? I do have advice. And the first is if someone tells you they have an ADA credential, don't hire them. Because people do say that and there's no such thing. There's no such thing as having uh, being endorsed by justice. There's no such thing as having sort of like a badge of, you know, this, I'm an expert in this. And there are way too many people um, in lots of professions saying that they have some expertise in ADA. When it comes to education, I think there are, honestly are a very small group of people who do that work and do it well. Um, there's not a lot of money in being an education lawyer, so people do not flock to it the way they do to, you know, some other practices. The best way to find a lawyer is to call your state bar association and ask for a list of people who are educational practitioners who do um, K through 12 ADA work. Uh, and you should be able to secure a list then. And then you're kind of on your own to um, kind of do some of your own research if you have access to a computer or a library. Uh, so that's one way. Uh, the other way is in every state there's a disability, there's a protection and advocacy system. There's usually a governor's committee, uh, but certainly uh, there will be disability rights organizations that are nonprofits or public private partnerships. They may uh, have people on their staff who either do that work or who know how to find good practitioners, you know, in your area. Um, and some of, uh, there's a lot, I want to, I just want to do one plug also for justice. They have an absolutely terrific website, not for finding a lawyer, but information about um, the ADA. Uh, like, for instance, I get lots of calls from parents who, who schools won't administer diastat for their kids with epilepsy. It's just rampant. And so I send them the settlement agreements that Justice has done on this issue with daycare providers and with schools. So if you go on ada.gov and just plug something into um, the search and you come up with something where um, IDA, IDEA was an issue, look at who the lawyers were. Not for the Justice mm -hmm. Department side, but, but you know, often there are organizational lawyers or private lawyers who are also on the plaintiff's 
disabled person's side of the case. That's another way uh, that you can try and find a lawyer. Okay, thank you, Allison. That that was really helpful. And, and I know that we're one minute past our hour of our cutoff time, so um, we have many more questions in the chat box. And, and thank you um, for entering those. I would like to um, just say, if you have any further questions, please send them to advocacy at MDA USA is our is our email address. Um, again, that's advocacy at mdausa.org and, and we'll try and get back to you um, with any answers that we can or, or other resources. Thank you so much, Allison, for joining us today. It's been so great to have you on and you. Um, for this really helpful discussion. I know a lot of people have enjoyed it, especially considering all the questions that came in. Um, and we are grateful to have you here and I hope everyone else has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.